Well, everybody's taken their seat. Let me, uh, I'll d uh, give an introduction. My name is Wendy DeMarc Wanafried, and I am from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And our last session of the, the day is going to be on cancer care in resource limited areas, cancer prevention and early detection in all other areas besides the tobacco. So this is going to be kind of a whirlwind tour of other health behaviors and risk factors. Our speakers are going to be Monica Baskin from the University of Alabama, Birmingham, Fabio Almeida, who's at, currently at Virginia Tech, but soon to be at the University of Nebraska, and uh, Douglas Mor Morgan, who is at Vanderbilt University. And so we're going to go on a journey. Uh, we're going to start in the Black Belt of uh, Alabama. And this uh, is uh, uh, not known as the Black Belt because of any sort of racial um, uh, designation. Instead, it's the Black Belt because of the soil. The soil is very rich in the Mississippi Delta, and so you have that band that extends from basically the Mississippi onto the crescent up there. Uh, however, this is an area that is known for being very under-resourced. It's known as really the, the third world of the United States. Then we're going to go to Brazil, and uh, we are going to... Now, Brazil is also one of the powerhouses of South America. However, despite the fact that it is an economic stre uh, strength, it also ha has uh, pockets of just absolute poverty. Uh, a lot, there is a large pocket in the northeastern part of the nation, but uh, in the rural areas, but then also in the cities as well. And then finally, we're going to make a stop in Central America and, um, and talk about the under-resourced areas there. So despite the fact that we're going to go to three parts of the world, Really, if you erase the borders, there's really not that much difference. And so we're going to be talking about some of those differences, but a lot of the commonalities that go across these areas. Now, we're going to be talking about diet. And one of the things that we're going to be talking about is obesity. Uh, here are the worldwide maps uh, as far as obesity goes. And the red nations are those nations that have obesity rate, or these are overweight, of greater than 60% are the red areas. But then the orange areas have 40 to 60%. So what we're seeing here with obesity, uh, worldwide, 35% of adults are o overweight. 11% are obese, and that has doubled since 1980. 65% of the world's population lives in countries where overweight and obesity kill more people than any sort of underweight or malnutrition. So this is a conundrum, um, somewhat of a paradox, because uh, here we have poor nations, uh, which heretofore really had high rates of, um, high rates of hunger. Uh, and now these nations are, are having food, food enough to uh, subside on, and food enough to get fat on, uh, however, really not well nourished. And so, the, again, uh, somewhat of a paradox here. This uh, map shows the prevalence of uh, insufficient physical activity. And uh, I, I must admit, I w when I pulled up this map uh, from the WHO, I was a little bit surprised to see I was really kind of picturing that the United States would be much um, higher uh, than it is. And indeed, there are other nations in the world that are in it more inactive than we are. Um, however, uh, this is also one of the, the problems that's becoming more and more prevalent um, and throughout the world. So as we go from kitchens that may look like our own um, to kitchens that may look like this um, to hot plates, uh, we do get different types of dietary patterns that occur. Not only different types of dietary patterns, different types of environmental exposures. And that hot plate may not necessarily be a hot plate. It may be an open fire someplace that, that 
um, people need to cook their food on. Um, as you go from the, the left part of the screen to the right part of the screen, not only do you not have the utensils to cook, but you probably don't have the refrigeration to keep foods cold. And so therefore, you're probably not going to have your lean chicken and your fresh fruits and vegetables because you can't keep them you can't keep them refrigerated. You can't keep them fresh. Uh, and uh, so you're you know, going to be eating foods that may not look like chicken. They, they may be Vienna sausages, and they may be potato sticks. Uh, and those are not necessarily the most healthy foods that we, we can put into our bodies. Um, here is a uh, picture from San Paulo, Brazil, showing you the physical activity options. And as you um, can see here, and the pointer here shows that if you live on this side of the wall, on the left-hand side of the wall, you most likely have physical activity options that are much different than on the right side, uh, and probably a lot less fun to do that sorts of, sort of physical activity that would be on one side of the wall as opposed to the other. So talking about some of these barriers is what we're going to do. Now, um, I'm going to go back here. Um, I uh, am from the University of Alabama at, at Birmingham, and I made that decision to go there about five years ago. And one of the motivators to, to go there was to do uh, do a lot of good uh, in the best way that I could see fit. Uh, I do work in cancer survivorship, so my work is, my research is much different than the presenters that are going to present in this panel. Uh, however, every day is like a combination of an um, academic position where I could be ordering tests on the microbiome or uh, any sort of blood test that you would want at the university level. Uh, and then uh, it's also a combination of a mission trip. Uh, and uh, an example of that is, is that we have a study that um, is a study where we basically, we t uh, I do work in cancer survivorship. So we take cancer survivors and uh, we pair them with um, master gardeners from the Cooperative Extension. And over the time of a, a year, the master gardener helps the cancer survivor uh, with three gardens, a summer garden, a spring, uh, fall garden, and a spring garden, and helps them garden. And the end, the end point of that is to improve physical functioning, improve diet, improve physical activity. And it's uh, just a gangbuster intervention. It re really works well, and we're really proud of it. Um, however, one day I got a call from a master gardener, and uh, I'm going to try to do a southern accent here. I was born and raised in Detroit, so I'm not good at this. Uh, but uh, I got a call, and, and uh, I get this uh, voice on the line, very shrill. Uh, Dr. Wendy, Dr. Wendy, I just can't. I just can't do it. I said, okay, you can't do what, and who are you? And uh, she said, well, this is Leanne. I said, oh, Leanne, what can't you do? She goes, I can't make my, my survivor a, a garden. I said, OK, well, why can't you make your survivor a garden? And she says, well, you know, you've been at this long enough. What do you need to make a garden? You need soil. You need sun. You need seeds. Now, what else do you need, Dr. Wendy, to make that garden? And I said, I think it would probably be water. And she said, right, you need water. This woman just don't have any running water. And so she, you know, here we had uh, uh, gone out with all of our supplies trying to have, make a garden, a raised bed, for this cancer survivor, breast cancer survivor and uh, arrived there with our raised bed and our plants and the master gardener with her shovel and all, all the anticipation of helping this woman make a garden, but there was no running water. And so what do you do in the situation there? So um, in, in our case, we punted. In our case, we cobbled together something uh, and uh, got some rain barrels together, got some big... Um, uh, containers for, for water, uh, but we only had to do one patient, uh, one cancer survivor. 
And my hat is off to the people that are going to be speaking to you now because they really take populations in their hand and they deliver um, interventions that just do miraculous things. And so uh, I have the privilege first of, well, let, let me uh, just go back here. We're going to have a, a, a variety here at the very end. We're going to talk about various cancer prevention uh, for um, breast, prostate, colorectal, gastric cancer. We're going to go from uh, social determinants of health all the way down to the microbiome. So the, it's going to be a very broad presentation. And uh, our first speaker is going to be Dr. Monica Baskin. Uh, Dr. Baskin is a professor of medicine at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. She is a clinical psychologist by trade, and she has done a multitude of uh, projects, led a multitude of projects, uh, in areas that focus from the individual, the family, to the community. She does a lot of community-based participatory research. And her focus is on healthy eating, physical activity, obesity, and cancer prevention. And I am going to now let her take the podium, and we're off to our first journey. <laughs> 